thanks for coming. I hope you're having a good uh, first day of uh, Unite. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ryan, and uh, I'll be talking to you today about uh, the process that we went through uh, to bring uh, our game Republic from Unity 4 to uh, Unity 5. So, um, yeah, I'll just give you a little bit of background to start. Uh, yeah, our company is called Camouflage, and uh, we've been working on this game Republic for about uh, the past three years. Uh, the game was released episodically, and so uh, episode one came out uh, in December of 2013. Uh, that was the iPhone and uh, iPad only. And then in April uh, last year, we released episode two uh, on I iOS, and then Last October, we released episode three on uh, iOS and Android. And then from there, uh, we knew that we wanted to bring the game to PC and Mac. And so the reason um, that we decided to move over to Unity 5 is because we were very concerned uh, that just the, the, the core graphics of our game on mobile uh, would not satisfy the PC users. So we invested a lot of time and effort to uh, bring the game to a higher fidelity uh, via Unity 5. And that's kind of what brings me here today. So uh, the, the PC version uh, shipped uh, at the end of February, early March this year, right around the same time as Unity 5 itself. And uh, you can see that these are some of the, um, sorry it's in English, but uh, these are some of the reviews that we got for the PC version of the game. And we're really, really happy to have uh, the strong response. And so, um, yeah, this, I think this really helped us give visibility and a good marketing um, to get, get something more excitement for the game. So this is what the game looked like in Unity 4. And if you saw the keynote, um, the, the graphics are much, much improved now in Unity 5. jump right into it. Uh, this, this talk will get a little bit technical, um, which is why I, uh, I decided to add some English text on here. If you want to take a picture and then take it back to your office or take it back to your home, uh, it might be the best kind of resource. Uh, we have a great translator uh, working for us today, uh, but even with the translation, sometimes these more technical terms and the way that we're using it, uh, it becomes kind of difficult at times. So sometimes it's best because you, you folks are very familiar with a lot of the English terms like uh, like physically based shader and enlightenment and surface subsurface scattering that uh, these English uh, paragraphs will be a good resource for you guys. All right, so um, as you can see uh, from the, the background image from Unity 4 to Unity 5, there's quite a drastic change. and. Um, So there was a lot of uh, variations in the quality materials uh, that we're using that weren't possible in mobile. And you can see in the screenshots that we're using uh, real-time real uh, shadows being cast of Hope, our main character. And we're not using uh, map, uh, map, uh, light maps baked into the textures. So just like uh, Stephen, one of our, our, our technical artists on the team was saying, um, Mobile had baked in light in using Beast, uh, which is kind of the precursor to Enlightenment and Unity. Uh, the environments were using only diffuse maps and parallax corrected to cube maps. And, creators, uh, uh, and, and characters created using a simple BRDF material utilizing lookup textures, which allowed us to customize how light would roll off the character normals. And the characters received all of the lighting from, uh, from baked in uh, light probes. That's how we did it previously. So the PC graphics has got a complete re overhaul. Uh, we use the out of the box uh, physically based shader from Unity 5, and we also use um, this uh, alloy metal rough workflow, as we're going to talk about a little bit later on about what an alloy metal rough uh, workflow is. Um, the characters and environments are all lit by dynamic lights, reflection probes, and they support subsurface scattering. 
um, use, utilizing the wake up textures to define how lighting would transmit through skin. So let's talk a little bit about that. So here's a, another example of a Unity 4 versus a, a Unity 5 on the right. And uh, you can really see the, the it's a really dramatic difference um, using, using uh, the, 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 in, in Unity 5 and using um, you know, the new lighting system. You can see that the, the light is coming directly from the, the, from the cell phone that Hope is using. And it just bounces off her face much more naturally. And the, the lighting just doesn't have that kind of uniform quality that we had on mobile, um, the very unrealistic uniform quality. There are uh, subtle uh, gradations in light and shadows, thanks in part to the use of a real-time global illumination. And Hope's hair and Hope's skin have been transformed using physically based shading, giving her hair and her skin um, a textural quality that we just didn't have on mobile. And again, this is using Alloy's uh, skin shader. Next up, we have um, this interrogation scene from episode one. Uh, you can see that the cold metal of the table really stands out um, with the harsh lighting um, above. And you can see the, the, the variance in the qualities of materials that we're using. And you can also see, again, the, the power of Alloy's uh, skin shader. Um, with the supporting with supporting detail maps, um, along with her hair shaders, allowing for a much more realistic uh, Fresno fall off. And I'll go into a little bit more later on about how we actually converted these assets. Um, but uh, a lot of the what you're seeing in the difference is really just due to the to the shading and the shaders. So how do we accomplish this all as a studio? Um, these are some of the things we'll talk about. Uh, we'll talk about the initial investigation that the team went through in Unity 5. Then we'll cover um, how the team moved over to a new, new branch in source control, um, because we were doing this during the production of episode three. Um, we'll discuss the move to physically based shading and, uh, and getting all those textures converted and looking great in Unity 5. And then we'll include some uh, details about best practices, and uh, especially for the art creation pipeline. Uh, I'll cover the game's lighting and how we made the most out of the new lighting features while also making sure our game performed well. I'll also touch on uh, optimization and uh, what we did both before um, production and uh, during the final, final stretch. And uh, like I mentioned during the keynote, um, if you go to this URL at the bottom, um, again, it's all in English, but uh, that has a much, a very detailed uh, blogs, videos, and podcasts that detail how the team went from Unity 4 to Unity 5, and I think it's a great resource. All right. So the initial investigation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we had a, uh, a test scene, and uh, we decided to commit to, and we, just, we did this before we decided to commit to a full remastering of the game in Unity 5. So none of our artists really had any experience in physically based. So that led one of our artists, uh, Stephen Howard, uh, to conduct a crash course for the team. Uh, we would bring in other people from, in Seattle, we have a, a really vibrant game development community. And we brought a friend over from, uh, from a, another game company who had experience in physically based. And we had him come into the studio and give a tutorial about what physically based shading means, and this is how it's going to completely change your art pipeline. So that was kind of what's going on the art side. Then, on the technical side, we had programmers who were opening up the project in Unity 5 uh, and to see what was broken and then fixing a lot of the code. So from the very beginning, we had very, like we had those pink textures that show us that we have uh, some severe problems and inoperative uh, pipe, uh, plugins. In other words, the game is a, was a total mess when we loaded it in Unity 5. 
So the first thing we did was we began ripping out everything that wasn't completely essential to getting the game up and running. And that means our plugins, our in-house tools, that all had, they all had to go. And one of the really scary things was we have this uh, mode in the game called OmniView. And if you watch our trailer, sometimes the game pauses and goes into OmniView. And uh, that's kind of like our hacker detective mode. And that, that mode just didn't work in Unity 5 at the beginning. So that was very scary. So, um, but um, the, the good news is, um, well, one, is that when we were doing this, Unity 5 was still in alpha, not even beta. So we were encountering lots of different problems that you will not have to encounter now that Unity 5 uh, has a full release and is out of beta. Um, the other bit of good news is that uh, this is what our team was able to accomplish in just a matter of days. Um, a handful of artists and one programmer uh, converting all the textures here that you're seeing in the scene. We took one room and we just did a test, you know, a very quick test. And uh, when we saw this test and we uh, showed it to our friends, we thought, you know what? The, the difference is definitely dramatic enough to warrant us converting all the textures and doing all the work to completely transform her from Unity 4 to Unity 5. You can see Unity 5 is on the left and Unity 4 is on the right here. Okay, let's talk a little bit about migration. So we wanted to do this um, in a way that would minimize the impact on the project uh, because nobody really likes to be sidelined by migration work. So we duplicated the project in a new branch of our source control to keep people moving ahead. So we had two separate branches, basically. We had our main branch, and then we had a special Unity 5 branch. And um, that special Unity 5 branch at the start was a stripped down version of Unity 5 with all the plugins ripped out. And this allowed the artists to start testing out what physically based shading meant and allows them to you know, just learn without having to worry about crashes and everything. And then meanwhile, our programmers were fixing the branch and adding plugins very slowly and working on script updates. And it actually was quite easy um, thanks to Unity's auto-updater, uh, which, examine, which examines all of your Unity 4 scripts and will automatically correct your syntax to accommodate the changes in Unity 5. So once that branch was, uh, after the auto-updater and our programmers did all the plugin work, then we moved over to the whole team over to the Unity 5 branch. And this took, this took a significant amount of time. So uh, let's talk about the migration on the physically based pipeline. Um, ours are the ones we did you know, really with above and beyond the Call of Duty um, when it comes to the Republic Remastered game. Um, so uh, Steven, for example, I mentioned him, he was responsible for implementing scale standards and texel density and making sure that everybody was getting a smooth transition in our project from mobile to PC. Um, so now, one of the big questions that the art team had to answer was what physically based shading pipeline they were going to use, because there's more than one. Now, I'm not going to explain the difference between a spec gloss pipeline and a metal rough pipeline, um, but they do have both advantages and disadvantages. So in order to showcase UV5's tremendous out-of-the-box uh, how are we, we transform some of our beautiful marquee spaces using Unity's standard shader. But for other areas of the game, including characters' hair and, and character skin, we used a really, really great sh a shader um, created by these uh, friends of ours at a company called Rust, Rust Limited. And uh, they developed a great metal rough shading framework called Alloy. Um, I highly recommend you reach out to the to the Rust guys or find their plugin on the asset store because it's very very good. So switching from a legacy shader system where our artists had to you know tool everything by hand 
uh, we moved into a much more mathematically sound system, um, like physically based. And it was a difficult adjustment. However, once now that the team is fully used to using physically based, uh, it's pretty amazing to see uh, what they're able to accomplish and how they're very used to it and they just work in it naturally now. And there's no way we're going to go back to the old system. Um, so these are uh, a couple different solutions that uh, in terms of tools that I recommend using uh, when you're moving into the world of physically based. Uh, one of them is called uh, algorithmic, uh, and the other one is called Quixel. And I'm assuming a lot of people here uh, are familiar with these these tools. So the al algorithmic suite of uh, programs um, allow our artists to create a complex system of nodes in a non-destructive manner. It also allowed our artists to paint directly onto our models. So, if you use Alloy, Algorithmic uh, provides a custom shader that can be plugged directly into the Substance Designer program. Instantly showing what your final asset will look like once it's imported into Unity. Uh, some of our artists also use the Quixel Suite when they want the familiarity of the tools in Adobe Photoshop. So in other words, what these tools provide is really easy, simple, simple methods to assist you in making sure that the game you know, is supporting uh, your physically based materials, making sure that they're realistic, and it actually just helps with the, the pipeline make it a lot faster. So um, this is an area where I sometimes want to skip because it kind of, might be kind of boring, but then Developers come back and say, no, this is actually a really, really important part of your presentation, so please don't skip it. Um, so maybe, at, at, well, big companies have bad habits as well, but for our company, you know, 25, 30 people, uh, we, we're kind of like an indie, independent studio. Um, it's very common not to have great uh, organization uh, when it comes to your, your naming conventions and your file structure. However, um, as you grow as a studio, it's really important that you start becoming more professional, and one of those things is having more standard standards, and this really saved us when it came to our work in Unity 5. So uh, this, this thing, NOD, stands for Naming Conventions, Organization, and Documents. And this is that Stephen was really pushing for with the artists and the dev team, and it was really great. So, um, Again, I'm not going to go over each one of these things, but uh, this is just an example of how we would name something. Uh, and these are all based on rules that we set as a team, and this saved us so much time as we were starting to adopt many, 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 many textures into the game, converting them from Unity 4 to Unity 5. So, uh, for example, like M10 is the area of, is the name of the area. Met uh, stands for uh, metamorphosis, which is a, another a subsection of that area. So obviously, you can name whatever you want to name it, but make sure it's just consistent. Um, organization. This is uh, refers to the process that allows us to group content together and establish relationships among them. In this example, we have a scene called M10 Dorm Female Confinement 01. So using our naming conventions, you can see that the artists make it very clear how the content relates to one another. Contained in the hierarchy, they structure all the art scenes as listed in this slide. The root node in this case is dorm female confinement 01, and then that root has a bunch of subdirectories. And then finally, um, this is the kind of documentation uh, that Stephen and the team created, naming conventions, directory structures, 
Uh, we created another document called uh, the Art Creation Physically Based Outsourcing Document. We have a Unity 5 Workflow Document and a Physically Based Back to Single Texture Conversion Document. So in other words, if you are going to convert your project like you did, like what we did, um, it's not just a simple touch of a button that you, it, this becomes your full production of your team or a big part of your team is going to have to be focused on this because it is a lot of work. Let's talk a little bit about text density. Um, here's um, another example of uh, the text <laughs> that I decided to keep up there in English um, for you to take a picture of. Uh, just to get a clearer idea of what, we're, what we mean by text density. So this is the process um, that relates to the establishment of unit of measurements for our textures. So what we're doing is uh, we're establishing a uh, text density you're creating to make a better looking game. So this is benchmarking the work of everyone on your team, allowing for more consistency. So, textile density basically minimizes the memory overhead. And your game ends up feeling a lot more true to life because of it. So, uh, Republic, as you can see, uses a 64 pixels per foot. Uh, so that means if we have like a wall that's 8 feet high, then we know that it's going to be a 512 texture. And that way it means that all the artists know about this kind of level of consistency. Now, not everything is going to be exactly perfect, so we allow a margin of error of about 15%, which is pretty standard. So I'm going to move on to the next slide. Uh, so this is the difference you can see in action. Um, and this is like basically why you know, implementing standards is very important. Um, you can see like you know, one, one half of the screen has a different text density than the other. And these are the things that we wanted to avoid uh, in our game. This is not our game, by the way. <laughs> OK, so let's talk about a big, 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 big thing about our Unity 5 conversion, which is the physically based shading uh, conversion process. So um, I think the, the, high, the high level is that I was asking our art team, which at the time was about four people, to convert about 2,000 materials in 40 days. Uh, because the, the, the way the textures work in Unity 4 um, versus the way the textures work in Unity 5 is completely different. It requires us to convert every single one of these textures. Now, um, per, per material, there's five different maps. And this is required for physically based. So that means, based on my simple understanding of math, um, that we're looking at 10,000 textures because we need five maps per texture. So what that meant was um, the team came back to me and said, Ryan, uh, we know that you're trying to like really hurry up and, and finish the PC version and do this Unity 5 conversion, but for artists doing 10,000 texture conversion, this is not going to happen. So uh, they said, this is the first time we need to outsource as a company. And, uh, and thankfully, uh, we worked with a really, really great group of, of, of guys called uh, Blue, Blue Papio. And uh, these, these guys were so professional. Um, they gave us the best quote. Um, they gave us the most realistic timeline. And in fact, um, as they were going through the process of converting all of our textures, uh, they would send them to our artists who would then implement it into the game. And then uh, what we found was that they were actually converting the textures faster than our team could implement the game, or the, 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 the converted textures into the game. Uh, meaning these guys are very, very fast. So I highly recommend them uh, if you're interested in, in talking about them. So um, this is also a really important part of the presentation uh, because it talks about how we used, we created some in-house tools uh, to, to do this. 
These are things that are not included in UDP5. Um, we have talked about releasing these uh, publicly for free to anybody like you, you fine folks. Uh, but they are custom built for Republic, and we're worried that they won't be very useful to you guys. Uh, so, but if there's a way that I can provide them to you, if you want those tools, like please reach out to me. I'll have my email address at the end of the presentation. So um, these four tools, we'll go over the, the physically based material converter to start. And uh, this is an example, um, well actually, sorry. Um, Let's first talk yeah, about the, the, the PBS, um, the PBS uh, material conversion uh, tool. So with a single click, this tool would find your legacy material, your, your old material, and it would do the following. First, it would migrate the old shader to the new physically based, the PBS directory. It copies the old textures to a legacy folder contained in this directory. It then, it then reassigns our, our new updated textures to the correct material slots. And then finally, our scripts look at what the original textures were clamped to, because we had authored those textures at a much higher resolution than they appear in game. And then we apply that to the new textures. This takes a process that normally would take the team about 15, 10 to 15 minutes each time, down to a matter of seconds. So to put it, again, kind of simply, because that's, that's a very technical explanation, uh, we had a tool that took the old materials and then would assign the new materials to the correct uh, location in the, in, the, in the directory. And this was something that one of our programmers created in a matter of a few days. So let's talk again about the, like, the second tool that we created called the Material Assignment Script. So this is for 3D, um, for 3ds Max and Maya, um, and, and inside of Unity, which would apply pre-existing materials to you to your mesh if they don't have the same naming conventions. And then we created a prefab generator, and this is what we did, um, and, and this is what we did, and it created the prefabs from selection. This would take an FPX located in your hierarchy and convert every mesh file to a prefab. So the most important part of this is the last sentence there, which is this tool would take an FPX located in your hierarchy and then convert every mesh file to a prefab. And then we, uh, finally we have this mesh replacement. And what this would do is replace selection by prefab name. So basically, it would find any mesh in the scene, and if there was a prefab with the same name, it would replace the mesh with a, with a prefab. Um, next up is lighting. Um, this is a big, big uh, task for us, especially towards the end of the project. So one of the um, unfortunate limitations of working on mobile was that there was no accounting for somebody playing the game, or so to where they were playing the game. Um, I told the team not to talk about this publicly, but I'm okay with talking about it now. Um, is that this was actually a recommendation from Apple that we make sure that our game is as bright as possible. Um, because we were at first an iOS game, uh, we decided to follow their advice and make sure that the colors and everything was as bright as possible on those devices because this is something that Apple likes and we wanted to be featured by them. Uh, however, when we look into you know, moving the game to PC and Mac, our game is a sneaking game, it's more dystopian, it's supposed to be more dark and haunting, so we had to basically rethink about how we were lighting the game. So previously, we were limited to using baked-in light maps and forward rendering to optimize Republic 
on, on lower end mobile devices. So while it may have been possible to get dynamic lights working on 64-bit devices, like uh, you know new Samsung tablets, like the new iPad Air 2, um, we had to consider the limitations of mobile devices. However, when we go into PC and Mac, these devices, these, these concerns aren't as great. These limitations are not as great. So for the lighting phase, um, we had to get everybody on the team working on lighting. Uh, because there was just not enough artists to go into each room and relight it using the new Unity 5 lighting system. So towards the end, we actually had animators and designers actually helping us light each space uh, in the game. Um, another big change in our graphics was uh, was our switch from our 4 to a uh, deferred rendering pipeline. In order to really let the physically based shading sh um, sh show off its like how good it is, we wanted to have a healthy amount of dynamic lights in our game. However, as you guys know, dynamic lights are pretty expensive and uh, can really hurt performance. So, um, what what deferred rendering is is um, does is it improves the lighting performance by rendering out intermediate data. Like, like, so intermediate data, for example, diffuse and spec color to multiple rendering textures and then applies the lighting at the end in screen space to avoid wasting calculations on things that you don't see on screen. So it's very similar to a system in Unity called Umbra, um, which just really just focuses on efficient uses of, uh, of calculations. Um, here's another example of a um, wall of English text screen, um, which I think is going to be uh, helpful. But I'm going to read it anyway, and uh, our translator can, and I can uh, go through it. But basically, um, as I said, what deferred rendering does is it improves lighting performance by rendering out intermediate data, like diffuse and spec color to multiple rendering textures. It then applies lighting at the end of that process in screen space to avoid calculations on things that you don't see on screen. Now initially we had to do a lot of work to support deferred rendering in some of our shaders. <laughs> so that, mean, that basically meant that a lot of our shaders were broken for a while. We also had to reset our project to linear color space. Uh, and uh, that was a big difference for our game, is going to linear color space. So we had to go back and then change and fix a lot of particle effects and UI uh, to support this new change to the linear color space. So uh, we also utilized uh, light cookies. So light cookies are something that um, are used to create effect in Republic. This is not, this is not a Unity 5 exclusive feature, uh, but we get a lot out of these. Uh, we use these to avoid paying the cost of shadow casting. So for objects in our scene that are static, generally we are using light cookies. And then, for non-static materials, we're using dynamic lights for characters and moving objects in our game but we're using it very sparingly. So basically, you're getting a lot of the value of having shadows and that kind of sense of realism without the expensive cost of dynamic lights. All right, so we can talk a little bit about uh, reflection probes. text, I think it's more fun to read along. So our artists had to create a parallax, um, corrected cube map in a program like Maya, and bring them into the game to generate a, a semblance of reflectivity. Now our artists would go through our art scenes, 
segment them into cubes and cuboids to divvy up those reflection probes. With reflection probes, we're not generating spatially accurate reflections for the first time. We also have this option of whether or not we want to include certain objects in our reflection probe's cube map. And we just use the static tagging options. Now, if you're familiar with Unity 4, there's a static map, or there's a light map static, and this is pretty similar. Basically, if you have an object and it's dragged in as a reflection probe static, it goes into your baked cube map, which helps you with performance. Again, apologies for how technical some of these this, uh, this language gets. Um, so one of the biggest changes in Unity 5 is uh, the move from, from Beast over into Enlighten. And the ability to make use of real-time global illumination. And we're using real-time global illumination to simulate things that were only possible with dynamic lights in previous, previous lives. So here's a scene um, with the shader emission values and indirect lighting. And it gives us that mood that we're hunting for and it's kind of a police station. And it's not costing us much of anything. It's a very performance light space. So um, this is where you can see how we're using um, the, 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 GI, the GI charting, which improves productivity in, in, um, internally. Uh, also, as you guys know, uh, during the keynote, we announced that we're giving away next week um, a, a free project file of, Uni of the Unity 5 Republic project file. And you'll be able to see how we use GI scaling um, in that project file. It makes things very, very fast. So what you're going to want to do is you want to go into an object's properties, and you can see whether it's, factored in, it's factoring into a light map. Then you adjust the object's values to the point where there's only one or two GI charts per object. And what we're able to do then is dramatically decrease our baking times. So, for example, uh, our friend uh, Gu Kwan this morning was showing off uh, some of the baking techniques. That was taking a few minutes during the keynote. Um, however, um, if he was doing that in the Republic project file and using GI charting, that would only take a matter of seconds. Oh, and then here's a, here's a wall of text for you if you want to take a picture of it. That's basically what I just went over. Um, this, this technique, by the way, came from the developers of Enlighten. So if you don't trust us, you should definitely trust these guys. They know what they're talking about. Sorry, I hear more pictures being taken. I'll give you guys some time. I think it was when I said this came from Enlighten, not from Camouflage, and you're like, yeah, we've got to take a picture of that. Unify's profiler here to investigate uh, what's hogging the CPU or GPU. And um, one of our engineers is a huge nerd, and he has a really, really, his favorite feature is the frame debugger. It's new to Unity 5. And what the frame debugger does is allows you to zoom in on events, and then it'll take you to where that problem area is in the scene, and lets you just basically focus in on where you're getting those performance hits. So definitely try out the frame debugger. So for the Republic, what really came down to us for really bad performance was coming from shadow casting lights. Because there's really very few ways of, of optimizing those things.
Um, second, um, the next thing we did with the PC version, which I'm going to skip over quite, other than just basically to say that we added a lot of um, features that you're familiar with. Um, iOS games don't really do this, but PC and Android does this quite a bit in terms of having, uh, you know, uh, different performance settings that the user can set. So the team had to support these different things, for example, having shadows at medium or having model detail at high. Um, and by building those into the game, it allowed us to optimize the game uh, quite a bit. So this was a healthy process that the team went through. OK, so I'm going to wrap this thing up. Um, basically, uh, as you can probably guess from the last 45 minutes of the presentation, um, converting the game from Unity 4 to Unity 5 was a lot of work. I want to say that it took us roughly about four months and some change to do this. And uh, it, we did this in the middle of the project. Uh, we have two more episodes that we're creating. And uh, so we did this right in the middle. And if you're in the middle of your project, this might not be a really good move for you. Uh, however, if you want to use it as a marketing technique or you're just not happy with the way your game looks and you want it to look more next gen, more cutting edge, more AAA, this might be a good path for your, for your team. Uh, now, on the flip side though, if you're starting your new project, I highly recommend you start a new find and go through the tutorials and, and learn about physically based because this is definitely the, the future in terms of graphical techniques. Uh, and we're really, really excited about it to get out of the old Unity 4 version of things. So um, this is our email address on the bottom. This goes directly to our team. Uh, we have a customer service line, Zendesk. And all of your questions, if you have them in English, ideally, it'd be good. Um, if you send it to here, I promise that our team will respond to as many of the questions that you have. Uh, and also remember to download the free project file from Republic uh, next week off of the Unity Asset Store. And also, if you leave your business card with me uh, right after this talk, and you really want to check out the game, the Unity 5 game on Steam, um, on PC or Mac, um, just come up, leave your business card here, um, and I will email you a free $25 uh, copy of the game on Steam. So, <laughs> as a thank you to coming to my really boring technical talk. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, questions. We have time for questions? Because I see we have like, what, seven minutes? Do we have anybody who's going to do the mic, or should I just should I just do it? All right, I'm going to give it to this gentleman then. Um, does anybody have any questions? If you want to raise your hand, I'll make sure you get the mic. Well, oh, making me sad. Not even out of sympathy. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. You, I was really worried there.
네, 아까 말씀하셨던 툴들을 어디서 받을 수 있는지 좀 알려주시면 감사하겠습니다. Gotcha. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you. The uh, so there's a couple of areas. Um, one of them is uh, just on the Unity homepage, um, and it's called the Journey to Unity Five. And uh, if you search for Journey to Unity Five or Republic on the Unity assets or the Unity homepage, you'll find the blog posts and the videos and the podcast. And then um, also the free project file. It's got about five rooms from Republic um, in Unity 5. Uh, that's going to be available on the, on, I think it's called unityassetstore.com, the asset store basically. Now, I also talked about in house tools that we created. We do not have those available online yet, but if that's something you're interested in, I can't guarantee they'll work for your project. Um, but you can email us and I'll, I'll send you the code. It might not work though. And the gentleman over there got a question about it. I might be the end. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Uh, there's uh, two shaders primarily that we're using. Uh, the first one, the most important one, is Unity 5 has this thing called the physically based shader. So anytime I talk about the physically based shader, I'm referring to the standard shader uh, inside of Unity 5. Um, I hope it's okay for me to say this, but I think internally at Unity it was used to be called the Uber shader, meaning they kind of covered everything. So it's supposed to be a one shader solution for everything you need for your game. And so I think that's a very ambitious goal and I really love it and it's great. And the, the project file, that the free one, that's all of Unity 5's one physically based shader. It's a very dynamic shader. However, uh, our friends at, at Rust made that other shader I was talking about called Alloy. And Alloy is a really, really, really good solution for skin and hair. So we use two shaders. We use the standard Unity shader, the physically based shader, and then we also use the Alloy shader for the skin and uh, hair of the characters. I hope that answers your question.
Yeah, gotcha. So I want to be super clear that uh, we have done initial tests, but not thorough, thorough tests for every single uh, room in the game. Uh, so basically, we're basing our, 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 our guesses on initial initial investigations. Uh, but for the next you know few months, we're taking our episodes one, two, and three for PC and Mac, Unity five. And then we're moving them fully into to back into mobile, which is going to be a you know significant amount of work. Um, but no, to, to answer your question, we have not completed all of that work. I think that's up. Oh, welcome. Uh, and I think that's one o'clock or uh, what time is it? Five o'clock. That's so. Okay. Thank you so much for coming to the talk. I really appreciate it. Hope you have a good rest of your your night.